Welcome back for another episode of Domains 21. Uh, we have the distinct pleasure during this session to hear from Tim Clark and Laura Taub, who are both joining us from Muhlenberg College. And hi, Tim. Hi, Laura. How are you? Doing great. Great. So great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming, I should say. Um, thanks for coming remotely, right? As you can tell, you're probably not in the arcade. You wish you were, but mm -hmm. you're not. Um, so let me just introduce you quickly. Um, I know that, Laura, you are the, the dean of digital learning at uh, Muhlenberg. And Tim, you're an instructional technologist. So one of the things that really struck me as I was preparing to chat with you all is, you know, Muhlenberg's been pretty, you know, like, I would say, vocal about leading through what they call value-driven ed tech. And I'm compelled by this for various reasons, but I would love it if um, you talked a little bit about what that means and how you're doing that at Muhlenberg. Thanks, Jim. I'll open up with this question. Um, you know, we started formally with digital learning in 2014. So um, we, we, you know, when the, when the pandemic hit and all campuses went remote, we had, um, you know, a good five, six years of doing this work, including online and hybrid learning. From a, from a liberal arts perspective, um, it's been really essential for us to ground this work since its inception in our values as a liberal arts institution. And so I, I want to just start by saying that begins with relationships. And, um, you know, you introduced Tim and I by our roles, dean, instructional designer. Um, we really construct and enact our roles as, as pedagogical partners, first and foremost. We position ourselves in relation to faculty and students as, as learners alongside of them, as Tim likes to say, shoulder to shoulder. And so that, that when we talk about a values-driven approach, it's really rooted in relationships. It's also rooted in reflection because, you know, folks listening to this are, are likely aware that unreflected upon, technology introduces new barriers to equity, inclusion, and justice in educational settings. Technology has always been one of, if not the, um, preferred spearheads for commodification of education. Um, before, I, before I took on my administrative role, uh, my, my scholarship in media and communication uh, focused for two and a half decades on the commodification of learning and teaching through technology. And so the pandemic has really just amplified that political economic reality, um, decades in the making, a kind of plundering of our pedagogical relationships. So our work is really to lift up opportunities for critical reflection and practice. And so the values that we're bringing to this work uh, and that domains and OER and open education generally help us to enact are justice, equity, and inclusion. And all of our work in digital learning engages um, in ways in ways that are really sensitive to power and privilege and how they operate in and through the digital. Um, so the practices that Tim supports, that, that I support, really aim to promote work towards more equitable, just, and inclusive outcomes in teaching and learning. Now, let me ask you, one of the things that's interesting is, so what does that look like on the ground because I have been struck. I did come to Muhlenberg. I, I don't want to put a date on it because I forget, but I think it was 2015, 2016. And one of the things that really struck me was the way in which you all have invested in a very kind of, I guess, shoulder to shoulder is a great way to say it, sense of community. At the time you were talking about um, domains and donuts. And I know you have a, a new kind of community-based, community-driven kind of approach to getting people to explore the technology and think about it critically. Can you talk a bit about that and how you do that on the ground at Muhlenberg? Should I jump in here, Laura? Okay, um, well, um, it happens in a couple of different ways. Um, I think, you know, um, 
we try to center students uh, in all things. And uh, so I will, I'll start the answer by saying that we have um, a program, uh, we, we call them digital learning assistants, but we really emphasize peer learning and peer support um, in our digital learning initiatives. Uh, digital learning assistants have a full semester of uh, training and close interaction with Laura, myself, our other colleagues, Lynn and Jordan. Um, and in that time, what we really emphasize is um, making a connection, um, recognizing that learning digitally can be stressful <laughs> and sort of recognizing that as, as you go through things, um, sort of centering, uh, you know, the person that you're working with. And, and so students can always expect to have uh, a peer partner uh, with anything that they might be assigned in a class or even uh, independent research that they might be doing. Um, they're going to be able to work with someone who's knowledgeable, but who's also attuned to um, the person that they're dealing with. Um, so that's, that's sort of one area. And then we try to also model and embody those same practices as we work with our faculty and staff. So um, for instance, we have learning communities that might center uh, domains. We call our uh, domain of one's own initiative Berg Builds. So we're now in our second round of a, of a pedagogical learning community around Berg Builds. And um, the idea here of sort of forming a cohort is that these same sorts of uh, faculty and staff relationships will develop and folks will support each other after the learning community concludes. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is um, uh, the physical space that we occupy on campus. Now we're online, but we've tried to sort of recreate those, um, those same sensibilities in our online space. Um, and one of the things that we do are uh, when, when we're in the library is uh, we hold these drop-in sessions. We call them Domains and Donuts. It's really easy. It doesn't take any planning, really. Uh, hang a few flyers and send out an email blast, but just having some donuts around and people knowing that they're not imposing or intruding, that it's space that's reserved for them to come ask questions, try things, show off. You know, we always encourage a kind of show and share attitude because when people are fired up, it's infectious and great, and um, and so that's what those that's what those are um, those are for. Can I just add one little thing to Tim's description there, which so aptly captures um, the context we're missing right now uh, in in our remote work? But you know, one of the things Tim and I share, um, which is so delightful in our collaboration, is a real. Um, respect for and passion for community media. And so a lot of my earlier work grows out of um, decades working with youth media, creating community-based uh, spaces for local youth to make their own media. That's partly what drew me to Domain of One's Own, the idea that this is a kind of community-driven media-making endeavor. And so Tim and I both bring that kind of framework um, to the domain's work, to the, to the kind of community-based work he was describing. And, you know, we talk a lot about community media. It's ethos. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definition as alternative indie space from mainstream corporate media. And, and we bring that same ethos and try to enact that. So the hive where digital learning sits in the library you know, Tim and I try to fashion that as as like a community media space. You know, it's interesting you should talk about community media because, you know, to step out a little bit of the, the fourth wall here, like part of what we're doing with this whole presentation that's showing right now is playing with the notion of video and TV and the idea of public access and the notion that there was a time before, and. I, you're a scholar on this stuff, so I don't want to pretend, but like there was a time before, say, our moment where these same values were real, whether it be Umatic three quarter inch tape or VHS or, you know, the actual old school like cassettes. 
Like the idea of mixing, maxing, and taking culture, or even the stuff we see with radio, really does speak a lot to that. And learning and bringing forward some of the lessons of you know the '60s, the '70s, the '80s, the '90s, and so on seems super important. Not only the metaphors, but also lessons learned and the kind of maybe one of the bigger lessons is that you know corporate media seems to eat everything and so how do we kind of back away from that we might be far afield but any thoughts on that given given the the work you're doing with domains for example not far afield at all jim you know when we talk about a values driven practice in digital learning at muhlenberg part of what we are um bringing to the work are those values from community media, um, not only in a US context, but in a global context. Um, Tim and I uh, have many conversations and share readings about um, historical moments, historical communities within which um, DIY, indie media, community-based media made all the difference in uh, struggles over power, struggles over democratic participation. And, you know, I, I told you at the outset, I, I was likely to take the kind of bird's eye view uh, in this conversation, but I, I don't think it's too high of a bird's eye view to say that to be an educator, to be a learner in the 21st century, in the midst of a global pandemic, is to be engaged in a kind of democratic struggle. If we're not, we can, um, we can say goodbye to uh, higher education as we know it. We, we ignore that struggle at our own peril. And so in the ways with the tools that are available to us, we see our work as engaging and engaging our community members in a kind of struggle for pedagogical practices that, um, that, that center the dignity and the right to participate, the right to voice and agency of students, as Tim emphasized, and our faculty and staff. Yeah, I, I would only add that um, <clears throat> you know, uh, this this responsibility that we have to not only be uh, consumers of information but also creators um, is democratizing, and when we set up. Uh, domain of one's own, when we set up Berg Builds, when we first go into classes and folks sign up for their domains, that's one of the things that we talk about is that there is a, a cycle at work where new technologies, new communication technologies emerge. And in the first phase, there's this excitement and expansion and democratization um, and access to new ways of seeing and thinking. And then over time, there's this sort of slow contraction as uh, corporate influences, as, as uh, capitalist influences sort of uh, take hold. Um, and, and the thing that's amazing about the web is even in our sort of frustrating moment that we find ourselves in now, it's been tremendously resistive to that uh, pressure uh, to consolidate. And so we talk about Audrey Waters um, mentioning the template itself, right? Um, if you look at social media platforms and the ways in which they limit how you might express yourself, how you might present yourself on the web, uh, domain of one's own is, is an alternative to that. And so we really try right from the beginning to say, you can make as much or as little of this as you wish, but you have the agency, you have the power to do that. And um, it kind of runs central through all of the ways that we hope to present uh, digital learning at Muhlenberg. One of the things that struck me as I was looking at, you know, bird builds as we prepare for this discussion is obviously domains plays a, a part, but it's not alone. It's one amongst many other tools that you all, whether it be hypothesis, whether it be timeline JS, whether it be, you know, Padlet, like you're constantly engaging and providing other means of access to kind of do that outside of some of the maybe normalized things that we've gotten into, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Um, so like, how do you, how do you go about that? Are those driven by the community? Are those driven by your group? Like what technologies and why? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, it's really handy to have digital learning assistants uh, occupy your workspace with you, you know, to be uh, your neighbors and 
and your colleagues um, in a sort of uh, you know physical space because you get to see what they're up to and what they're finding and what they're using. So that's one one way. And then obviously, you know, our faculty are very uh, creative and and adventurous as well. So we try to um, sort of make sure that. Um, you know, the, the tools that we support, the tools that we advocate for are good ones. Um, and they align with uh, sort of our values. But we also um, think of a domain of one's own as sort of the, the container or the, uh, the way in which all of these other kinds of things uh, can be presented or can, can sort of interrelate. Um, and so that, that's one, one thought that I have about that. I guess um, uh, the other thing, well, maybe maybe I'll, I'll throw it over to Laura here. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Just to add that, you know, we do this work in the context of a residential liberal arts college where our, our mission is to, um, is to engage students as learners, as, as, as future leaders, as critical thinkers, as uh, people who are skilled and able and know how to use the tools to imagine better futures. And so when, when a new tool or technology sort of comes to our attention, the first questions we ask are, you know, in what ways might this amplify student voice? in what ways might this afford students greater agency in their learning? Those are the, those are the key questions that drive whether we're going to invest time and resources in bringing a new tool to, to faculty and to students. And as Tim highlights, our digital learning assistants are key partners in discerning whether whether something is going to be at home in our particular context and assist us in advancing those institutional values as well. There's going to be a, a lot of discussion. Um, at, there is already a lot of discussion around um, at OER by Domains 21 around the idea of care, around the idea of the pandemic and what that's meant for instructional technologies, which took a, a weird center stage um, again, after the MOOC moment, we found ourselves in another strange moment where it's undeniable how important the work we do is for the viability and future of our institutions. So one of the questions was, how did that work out in terms of these digital learning assistants that you've referred to a few times? And it'd be interesting maybe to lay out that and how maybe you were able to kind of, you know, uh, support some of the demands that started to come in as everybody overnight about a year ago to the day shifted to fully online learning as the pandemic took full hold, not only in Europe, but then in North America. So what what was that like? And did that make you, I mean, we've been talking about the digital learning assistance in relationship to like uh, the Digital Knowledge Center at UMW as a way to kind of talk about peer learning and peer support. Did that pay dividends during this strange moment or not? And dividends might be the wrong word, so forgive me for using economic <laughs> language. Well, I'll, I'll launch us into this, and then I know Tim is going to have some really um, important specific examples to share. Um, I, I think it's critical that you mention the MOOC moment and the pandemic protracted moment uh, as, as related moments. Um, related in the sense that not only do they highlight uh, the role of technology in education for, for us as educators, but they also highlight the role of technology, the potential role of technology for, um, I think, venture capital. And so at both moments, we saw, we are seeing um, unprecedented sort of banging at the gates, right? And so I, I think it's really, um, insightful, Jim, that you frame it in that way. And, and we need to be thinking about those as related moments in the, in the you know, political economic push to um, drive technology to the very heart of the mission of higher education. Well, it's, it's interesting you. too, right, right? Both Coursera and Canvas were valued at multi-billion dollar kind of, you know, and IPOs. Zoom. And Zoom, like, 
it's it's interesting. Like there are the players who come out and the finances behind that. I don't know if you follow folks like Phil Hill and Michael Feldstein, but like it's interesting how they've become almost like economic reporters of ed tech, which I find so strange. Like it's like they're the Wall Street Journal of our of our field, and the field needs it because how important that's become. As is, of course, Audrey Waters, and and you know the the political economy of corporate ed tech that that Audrey's been doing for so many years now, uh, and the others you mentioned is absolutely central because by and large it's not well documented in in the mainstream press. But to to your point about digital learning assistance, you know, because our work has always been centered on students. It has always been centered on the meanings of technology in the lives of students and the learning of students. That allowed us to um, to ground our response to the pandemic, to ground the ways that we were going to respond as an institution to shifting to uh, ubiquitous online learning. We had already a practice a digital learning practice that, that centered students, not tech. And so in the examples that, or the, the more um, sort of specific details that I imagine Tim is thinking of, you will see that a, a response that begins from students, not from tech. Yeah, and, and, and so, you know, having conversations about um, monitoring how you're feeling, um, monitoring anxiety and, 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 you know, comfort, uh, in a face to face or, or shoulder to shoulder interaction really put us in a good place in having conversations with our digital learning assistants when we were all working remotely, um, because they had already, um, sort of, uh, had a reflective practice with respect to digital technology. And I think that that was tremendously important last year and now. And, you know, the other thing I think is, uh, uh, and we had no way of, of knowing, but because we've had so many conversations uh, with our faculty and with our administration about uh, a values-centered or a values-driven approach to educational technologies, I think that we had um, built up a, a fair amount of trust. And so um, as we're seeing this sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, crisis, um, uh, incentivize people to try and be more intrusive and more, you know, rely on, on surveillance technologies in education. I think that we were able to sort of resist that impulse because, um, we could, uh, assure our faculty and others, um, that there's, there's another way to go and that we have, um, experience with and history with, uh, doing things a different way. The trust Tim mentions is is so vital, and um, and it is it is absolutely something that has been built up over several years and allowed us to you know leverage the relationships that that we've uh, developed with faculty and students in the service of what what I think I'm really proud of at our institution is it is a more just and equitable and inclusive response to um, shifting in this pandemic. And, you know, one mark of that is that our, the, the college committee that works closely on these issues, the, the College Committee on Technology and Digital Learning, out of our work issued statements, policy statements, about exactly what Tim is speaking of, that, that the college rooted in its liberal arts tradition rooted in digital learning practices that center um, inclusion would not engage companies um, that, you know, purveyors of ed tech surveillance, including both exam, exam proctoring software, but also um, inclusive, the so-called inclusive access textbook publishers. So to have a college committee, to have a you know, a voice in shared governance at our college that is, um, that is, you know, kind of formalizing the message that that the digital learning team has been trying to enact is is very very meaningful on our campus. 
And I, I also think that, um, you know, we're, we're going to have some really um, uh, exciting and amazing conversations when we are all back together again. You know, making the case for open textbooks and OER, for instance, um, was, you know, um, a touchy conversation because folks are very fond of the books and they've put a lot of time into their selection and evaluation. But I think now, um, as we've all recognized the ways in which this moment has exacerbated the inequalities that existed before it, I think that we have an easier in on that conversation. And, and so um, not only in terms of our, our technological infrastructure, you know, at Muhlenberg, it's very easy for folks who start out with a WordPress site in a domain of one's own uh, to make the leap to press books, for instance, and start to imagine how they might uh, assemble or write a whole cloth, their own, their own texts for their courses. Now, the sort of moral imperative, I think, is going to be a little bit easier to talk to. And we already have that technological infrastructure that is ready for our faculty when they return to campus. Yeah, well said. I mean, and also the the notion, broader notion, like you brought up, Laura, is this moment has brought like different players to light. And I think the surveillance and tech uh, proctoring companies have really taken center stage as like, you know, the do no evil, uh, you know, vision we had for this technology coming to a full stop and realizing that there are sides and there's a struggle and, you know, our choices matter, both at the institutional and the individual level. And we've seen that, you know, in, in <laughs> there's been no shortage of examples that we can point to during the pandemic. And it's telling. And so the idea of trying to galvanize that as folks come back together and hopefully, like you're saying, Tim, not forget some of what we're learning right now is crucial and hard, right? Because a lot of us are going to want to forget the last year for various reasons, but there's some little nuggets we might want to take forward uh, if we're if we're going to kind of not make the same mistakes we seem to make, you know, cyclically with the choices of ed tech or technology more generally as a culture. So, and and Jim, if we're going to you know draw the lessons from the last year to to make things better so um it's it you know it will be one thing i i'm 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 calling on ruha benjamin's um words here paraphrasing it it's one thing to critique the systems of power um in in technology that are bearing down on education right now it's one thing to critique those um, and the ways in which they inscribe relationships of power in teaching and learning. It's another thing to imagine alternative worlds. And I think that that's the work that we need to turn to um, in the conversations that, that Tim mentioned and that we have reason to be excited for. We haven't seen um, students collectively resisting um, educational technology in the ways that we are seeing right now. And, um, and, and the more students have experiences with things like domain of one's own, with being co-creators, um, positioned as partners with faculty in pedagogical projects, like there's, there's so many at Muhlenberg that, you know, that Tim could point us to where, where technology is um, integrated so that students have more voice, not less voice. We need to draw from those lessons and students are not going to forget these experiences. We may want to move on and get back to something like the before time, but students are not going to forget. And, and I think that is to our great advantage if we're listening. It's brilliant. Well, that was, I want to thank you both for taking the time and talking to us today at OER by Domains 21. You both are doing some really cool work, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time out to share it with us, both the values and the ethos behind that tech. It's, it's super important. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Jim. Good luck. Thanks, Jim.